Hello and welcome to the video. This is another addition to the technical analysis series. It's also the fourth year, I think, of the TA series. So if you've hung around, you're still watching, still following my work, thank you very much. I hope some of it has proved valuable. Uh, if it hasn't, maybe this is the redemption video we've all been waiting for. Go ahead and like it, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. But let's talk about the topic at hand today, which is retests. And more than just retests, we're going to discuss breakouts, rounded retests, whether to even trade retests, all that breakout related stuff, as we'll see shortly. So here's the outline, nothing new here. We'll start with a disclaimer, some general remarks to set the scene. We'll then define the basic premise of this video, which is breakdowns and retests, including defining those terms. We'll then outline the dilemma that's usually presented when it comes to trading retests versus breakouts. So it's the idea of a trade guarantee versus or alongside risk reward. Then we'll talk about what a breakout actually is and some common traps and things that will make your trading more difficult so that we can avoid those things. We'll get into some detail about the types of retests, so in this case, the two main categories, which is immediate versus rounded, and then some, some of the actual useful stuff, <laughs> uh, the, the extra considerations that should play into your decision-making process when trying to assess whether to trade the breakout, the retest, both, neither, whatever, right? And those considerations are potentially a false dilemma, um, the existing trend or precedent that's being set by the market, risk reward considerations, hidden retests, which aren't as fancy as they sound, and then some notes on context, which are always important. Disclaimer, make sure to pause the video and familiarize yourself. I mean, we've been here for four years. I'm sure we know a thing or two. Not a professional, not a financial advisor, not a lawyer, nobody, really. Maybe you shouldn't watch this video at all, but, um, you know, trading's risky. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just an idiot, a clown, a jester here for entertainment purposes only. So with that said, some general remarks. What I hate about a lot of TA videos, I know, talk about starting on a positive note, is that they essentially prescribe a way of trading without knowing the person's system, the markets they trade, their style, anything like that, right? So we've avoided that, or at least I've done my best to avoid that in this video series. So it should come as no surprise that no one size fits all is the first comment with regard to the general remarks, right? The best results will come from testing, contextual decisions, adapting these broad frameworks for your specific markets, etc, etc. So whenever you come across this type of trading education, and they say you should always do this and never do that, very rarely is it some well-reasoned or comprehensive type of framework. So, so always be a bit cautious of that. Accordingly, the framework that we're discussing is applicable to a wide range of systems. So that's price action, you know, horizontals, market structure, Ichimoku cloud, moving averages, trend lines, whatever. Anything under the sun more or less qualifies for this, as long as you've got some sort of system which can identify breaks of structure, or even more simply, identify support resistance. It's, it's really straightforward. Not even just support resistance, just any turning points in the market, or a system which can identify bits of price which are important or you're expecting a reaction from, that's enough, right? So low bar, um, something you can, I'm sure, apply to some extent to whatever it is you trade. Another general remark, missed trades are normal. Okay, so breakouts vary, retests vary, the market varies. It just really depends, right? So tr trying to catch everything is, is unnecessary. This fourth point as well, a lot of trading education tries to almost remove all the uncertainty from trading and just say, you know, X always happens, always do X, never do Y, etc. Uh, as discretionary traders, that's just not how that the markets work. That's not what we're dealing with. That's not what we're forced to confront on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I, as I say here, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, confirmation quickly becomes cope-formation, right? It even fails the basic uh, logical test that if the market was so nice as to offer confirmation at every turn, then losing trades would be virtually impossible, right? Because you either got confirmation, great, you make money, or you didn't get confirmation, great, you didn't take a trade that was bad. And we know that the market doesn't operate to those degrees of certainty, so be wary of systems which promote it. Again, there is a very small handful of traders whom I know personally, like Trader SZ, and a few of my colleagues who actually have a well-defined rigorous system which tells them what confirmation is but even in those cases you're not avoiding 
the uncertainty of markets, you're just defining it slightly differently or planning for it, right? As a result, the framework we're working on is just trying to make higher probability bets and arm you with more information to make your decisions, as opposed to a basic checklist, always trade the retest when X, never trade the retest on Y. We're not dealing with that crap, right? Now, a very quick one to get off the bat so I don't need to confront it later in the lecture. What you'll often see is this blanket statement that the market needs to retest X to confirm it as support resistance. Just forget it, right? I don't know, I can't call this anything other than a notion because it's complete fiction. It'll put you in some absolutely terrible trades. The market doesn't have to do anything, uh, as we'll discover, but I don't know where this idea came from. It's really harmful. I've legit had DMs, you know, at the time of recording, Bitcoin's like under 60K or something. And I've had DMs of people telling me that they shorted the 20K breakout, the previous all-time high breakout in Bitcoin, because having broken it, price didn't come back to retest it. As a result, the market hadn't confirmed the 20k breakout as genuine, so they decided to sell. I mean, it's just nonsense. It doesn't stand up to any serious scrutiny, so don't do it. <laughs> as I say in the second bullet point, the significant event tends to be the break of structure itself. It doesn't suddenly become magically valid if price decides to come back to it, right? So, it's, so the level break or the structure break is what's important. The retest isn't what gives it significance, so to speak. So this would normally be a slide of its own, but let's just get this out the way and not give it any more time than it needs. Forget the notion that a retest always needs to happen to confirm one thing or another. It's just not true. I've already mentioned the last point. I'll make you know two more quick points. You don't have to trade every single breakout or breakdown. In fact, later on when, discuss, when discussing context, we'll discuss the circumstances where not trading a breakout or breakdown is actually advisable. So keep an open mind towards that. And the final point is, I've got some examples for these concepts, but given they're so broadly applicable to a whole range of systems, I'm generally not a huge fan of just spamming examples which make the markets look very neat. Um, you know, some setups will fail, some examples don't work. I've obviously cherry-picked to communicate concepts as clearly as I can. Don't expect the market to operate like clockwork in that regard. And the best and most meaningful study you can do is through your own time, your own trades, your own examples. So relying on them when trying to learn TA um, can hamper your progress. So what's the basic premise, breakdowns and retests? Hopefully you've watched some of the other videos um, during the course of the TA series. God knows where I'll put this in the playlist, but you should know what a horizontal level is and you should know what market structure is. So it should come as no surprise that losing support is typically bearish, right? And the breakdown and or retest of the broken support may be a chance to sell. Conversely, or inversely, I suppose, breaking resistance is typically bullish. And the logical corollary of that is that the breakout and or retest of the broken resistance may be a chance to buy, right? And this video largely addresses how, when, and whether to trade such occurrences. So I suppose at its most basic, you know, if we have a level of support, or a support structure, in this case it happens to be a horizontal level, right, where a previous bounce occurred, for example, if that structure is broken, right, on let's say a move here, then either the breakout event itself, right, or the retest of that previous support, so again the breakdown itself, or the retest may provide an opportunity to sell. That's kind of its simplest articulation. And then the same of course is true for resistance, you have a level of resistance when or if it is broken, the break of the structure itself or the subsequent retest of the structure may provide opportunities to buy it. Just to kind of restate what we're working with on a very basic level. So you saw in the previous slide there were two structures or potential trade ideas that are generated by a break of resistance or by a loss of support. One of them relied on trading the actual break of the structure, and the other relied on trading the retest of the structure. So the motivation for this entire video was someone asking, well, well do I wait for confirmation or wait for a retest, or is trading the break enough and I should go for that? And there is, a, just like with many things in trading, there's always some sort of built-in trade-off or balancing act that has to be performed. In this case, two things are being balanced. Risk-reward and certainty. So less certainty 
often offers superior risk reward. This applies to markets generally for getting just the TA side of things. And then more certainty often offers inferior risk reward. I mean, you could even arguably apply this to investing to some extent, but certainly when it comes to trading this technical side of things, um, this is applicable. So the basic example, of course, that comes to mind is trading at a level versus trading away from a level. Now, again, a very basic visual. Let's take buying a retest of broken resistance. So we'll start and make our structure nice and thick. There we go. Then we'll have our price line in, actually make it black as well. And this is kind of the path for price, for example, right? You get resistance and then you get a break of resistance occurring here. Now the expectation either way the trade is that you're expecting the market to trade higher, right? The break of resistance is your bullish signal and you want to trade on the bullish side. So then it's the question of, are you trading the retest or are you trading the break itself? And so this is where the trade-off unsurprisingly comes in. From a risk reward point of view at the very least, let's take some very basic invalidation type of ideas. If you're trading the break, then let's say your entry is on the candle close or structure close here, right? Let's assume we have a common objective in the form of the some sort of level of resistance above market here. And then we also have the same stop loss, again, taking a very crude example, a market structure based stop loss at the low. OK, just to bring the models in mind. So from a breakout point of view, the entry is generally triggered once you get an appropriate candle close, something we'll discuss later, through the structure that you had as resistance. So in this case, it would be where the blue line is. That's the breakout entry. Now, the retest entry would, of course, be at or near the level that was broken in the first place, which triggered the bullish idea. So we can overlay that on top of the level from which the trade idea is derived. So more or less here. And you can see this gap that's created as a result is the kind of risk to reward or extra R that you sacrifice as a result for going or electing one choice over another. And that's kind of the simplest way of showing you that trade-off. So even if you, you know, this is your entry, this is your stop loss, and this is your target, and then this is a potential entry as well, it becomes quite clear, at least it should, unless I've done an absolutely terrible job, that the retest entry offers superior risk to reward because you're closer to your stop loss with the same target, okay? Whereas the breakout entry offers an inferior risk to reward because again, the stop is the same, the target is also the same, but you're further away from the stop or perhaps close to target, however you want to articulate it. So that's kind of the trade-off at its core. The bullish idea is generated by the breakout event and then it's a question of where do I get involved? If you get involved back at the structure, you get better risk reward, but no guarantee that you get filled at all, right? Maybe the trade won't trigger. Whereas if you're trading the breakout event itself, you are guaranteed a trade, right? Because you're entering on the break, but you may sacrifice your risk reward on that trade uh, as the cost of doing business or guaranteeing business one way or another. And one thing we'll discuss is that sometimes this first option of trading the breakout, it's so far from the level which generated the idea in the first place that the risk reward has become so bad that the idea is inactionable in itself, right? I mean, we'll revisit that concept, but just to be clear, I wanted to do a very basic version of outlining what the dilemma looks like. So hopefully that's clear. The text is much clearer now, um, now that we've got a couple of chart examples, uh, and that's kind of where the dilemma comes in. If you wait for a retest, you get superior risk reward, but no trade guarantee, just like in our diagram, right? If you trade the breakout, you get a guaranteed trade in most cases, but at the cost of an inferior risk to reward. So there are trade-offs, and this video kind of seeks to address the question of when do I do one over the other, if at all, okay? And again, same thing here, less certainty often offers superior risk reward. So if you're buying the retest of the level, it's not clear whether the breakout's gonna hold or whether the market's gonna bounce from that level, etc. but you get the premium, if you will, or the benefit of superior risk reward. Whereas if you're waiting for all the bullishness to kick in, all the candles which look great, etc., the market will necessarily be further away 
from the breakout level because you're waiting for that evidence of bullishness to emerge. So that's good. Probability is on your side and you'll guarantee a trade, but the cost of doing that or waiting for that evidence to emerge is inferior risk to reward. I hope I've made that somewhat clear. If I haven't, rewatch it and <laughs> I hope I have. So gauging a breakout, this is really important and it's kind of taking a step back, but a very important step back. As should be the, quite obvious by now, the video relies on the idea that the breakout or breakdown has taken place, right? There has been a significant shift in structure or level rolling over, whatever. And then, as mentioned earlier, we're trying to answer how, when, whether to trade it, retest, breakout, whatever. Now, the whole video goes out the window if there is no real quote-unquote breakout or real quote-unquote breakdown. So these principles become inapplicable if you're buying a failed breakout or selling a failed breakdown. So in effect, you end up buying resistance or selling support, which are things we don't want to do, if you've misidentified a breakout or a breakdown. I suppose the final way I could rephrase to articulate this again is that we said that a break of resistance is a bullish setup, so if you misread that breakout, you're essentially getting bull trapped, right? Or we said that a break of support is typically a bearish setup. If you misread that, you're getting bear trapped. And all of those things are things we don't want, okay? So obviously we need to come up with some sort of heuristic to make sure that a valid or real or high probability break of structure has taken place before implementing the framework we've learned so far and are gonna add weight to later in the video. So one quick way of doing that, and again, it's quick but imperfect, is by aligning timeframes, right? So if you've got a daily level of whatever, moving average, support resistance, market structure, use whatever you use, in order to filter a lot of the noise, you can simply opt for time frame alignment. That is to say, if you've got a daily structure, it's only broken if you get a daily candle close through it. And if you've got a four hour structure, it's only valid if you get a four hour close through it, et cetera, et cetera. So basically scale or align the structure with the break timeframes. And again, I've got a whole video on timeframes, which you've hopefully watched as well. If not, maybe this will be clearer. With that in mind, or maybe even going a step backwards, why, why is that important, right? And it's important because you can get time, what I call timeframe traps, you all know I hate making up language, so I'm sure it's called a million other things. It doesn't really matter, but it's the idea that a low time frame, quote unquote, breakout at high time frame resistance can just be a wick, and a low time frame breakdown at high time frame support can just be a wick as well. So let me bring some chart examples to make that uh, clear. So let's jump out of this for a second, and let's go to the Bitcoin daily chart. Bitcoin daily chart, I've used the replay mode and just to take us back a little bit, and we had a daily level of resistance in the form of this cluster at around 52K. And then you can see a pretty straightforward retest of resistance uh, on the underside of this level here, right? So on the daily time frame, this looks pretty unambiguous, right? It wicked the level and closed below it. There's nothing kind of bullish in terms of breaking this level, or no good evidence that the level has failed to act as resistance when we're looking at a daily level on the daily time frame, right? So with time frame alignment intact, everything looks in order. Now let me bring your attention to an intraday time frame where we actually have that same level but viewed on the hourly, right? Now look at what you get. This is the hourly time frame looking at a daily level and you get a really bullish looking close through it, right? Looks like, looks like a breakout, except as you can see, what followed was an engulfing candle and then the market trading away significantly from the level. So this bit of price action here, which looks like a low time frame breakout, actually ended up being the high time frame wick. So what you see in the box here is literally this wick being formed, which taking us back to the slides, a low time frame breakout at high time frame resistance can be just the wick, which is what happened here. High time frame resistance, low time frame breakout, ended up being a wick, which is why having either rules around time frames or rules around breakouts and breakdowns generally, that's why that is so important. And obviously the same applies for support. I think I've got an example as well. Let me bring that up in just one second. 
Yes, I do. Talk about preparation. Here we are. Same um, instrument, right? Bitcoin dollar daily chart. We've got support, the bottom of the range at 44K. And again, on the daily time frame, this looks pretty innocent or unambiguous, right? From your basic uh, TA analysis, price is closing above the level of support, respecting it, nothing too scary looking, right? At, le at least there's no real ambiguity on the daily time frame. However, if we then look at that same level, 44,850s on the intraday time frame, you can actually see price trading below the level or quote unquote breaking down before ultimately sending much higher. So this portion of, again, low time frame price action at a high time frame level, all of this ended up being the wick. So it's that same trap we talked about just on the other side, a low time frame breakdown. It's in quotations for a reason. At high time frame support can just be a wick. And that's exactly what we've got here. The markets at daily support at 44,850. There's a breakdown below 44,850. But because you're kind of jumping the gun, looking at lower time frames when assessing high time frame structure, you essentially end up being the wick or getting bearish in the wick portion of the candle before the high time frame does its job. Again, it's that distinction where the daily time frame shows no ambiguity, but if you're zoomed in watching these high time frame levels through low time frame lenses, that's how you get trapped. Okay, or certainly one of the ways in which you get trapped, which is essentially what I'm cautioning against uh, in this section. You kind of need to be fair when assessing breakouts or breakdowns. Certainly when dealing with high time frame levels, just ask yourself, have I given this level enough time to prove whether it's been broken or not? Or am I at risk of being the wick? Again, this is something I cover in the time frames video, so make sure to check that out. But these kind of time frame traps are important. And in my opinion, they most frequently occur when you're just hyper zoomed in on low time frame price action at high time frame levels. Okay. Again, a topic perhaps for another video and certainly in the time frames video, but try to be as certain as practically possible that a break in structure has actually taken place before using these principles. You don't want to just be chasing price around uh, and end up getting bearish at the lower wick and bullish at the upper wick in practice. Now again, we're working a bit with definitions, but not all retests are made equal, right? So just some definitions. I think the two categories which are useful for us to understand are immediate retests and rounded retests. Now, as the name suggests, the immediate retest is when you trade at or near structure when it breaks, right? So at the time of the breakout or the breakdown. So as the bullet point says, you're trading the break itself. If you're having that kind of conversation in your head, it's X, whatever it is, moving average level market structure, just broke, what's my action here, right? So you're kind of following up or acting on the breakout or breakdown event itself. You're very close to that occurrence. Whereas on the rounded retest, you're trading at or near structure after the breakout has played out. So it's not, it doesn't matter the breakout event itself, you're trading once the move has played out and the market has returned to that same area where something significant has taken place, right? Again, the internal um, dialogue, if you will, or monologue, I guess, this was a big area that the market moved away from. What's my action now that we've returned to it? Okay, and some chart examples, of course, will be useful. So let me bring those up. Okay, here's, here's actually quite a good example. Let's look at ETH USD uh, on the weekly time frame, right? So we've got the 2017 high uh, at around 1420. And this is one of those charts which kind of has evidence of both. So this is prior all-time high, so important level. And then you had the weekly close above it here, right? So that candle close would be trading or taking decisions following that candle close would be trading the breakout. Whereas the subsequent pullback to the level a couple of weeks ago, that would be the re uh, kind of rounded retest variant. Now, immediately, this really isn't the best example in the world. And the reason I say that is you normally want more time and space between a break of the level and then the rounded retest, right? This portion tends to be significant. So not an A plus example, but generally speaking, the more time and space uh, that takes place between a break and a return to the level, the better it qualifies as a rounded retest. Or perhaps if you kind of have to ask yourself, is this a rounded retest? It probably isn't, right? 
Um, I think I've got a better example somewhere. Yeah, of course I do. Uh, if daily chart uh, shows this quite well. And again, you can see the same two principles at play. The breakout candle or the kind of the, the breakout retest, if you will, or trade uh, is a close through this same old 2017 level. Whereas the rounded, so, so kind of this, your decision making process will be here. The, the immediate breakout decision, decision process will be within or following this candle. Whereas the rounded retest, again, it's taking place or based on the same level, right? The same old 2017 high. Whereas here you are taking action immediately. Whereas in this instance, price has rounded out since breaking. Time and space has passed between the break and the retest. Um, and that's kind of the distinction between those two types of structures. So again, the main distinguishing factor is time and space. If you're trading here, there's very little time and space bet um, between the break of the level and where the market is now, right? You're trading the breakout itself, whereas here more time has passed, a lot has happened, and you're trading a return to the breakout point. Doesn't It may seem like a trivial distinction, but it is quite important, as I'm sure we'll discuss shortly. So again, immediate retest at or near structure, like those first cases, and rounded retest is when a lot has happened since the break, and then the markets come back to that level itself, right? So what are the considerations? Is there one you should trade over another? How are they different? A few points. The first is that rounded retests offer an easier decision-making process, given you're not, trading, you're, not, you're not trading the break itself, right? You've got more time to plan, maybe more structures formed between the break and the retest for you to target as a take profit or put a stop, you know, use for a stop loss, whatever it may be. Um, there's less of a rush, as I mentioned in the third point, right? There's more time to think, plan, act, etc. Rounded retests tend to be clearer setups. So the fact that the retest is rounded implies that a meaningful break took place. So you essentially eradicate the risk of falling for, well, you reduce the risk of falling for a failed breakout or a failed breakdown type of setup because the fact that the market broke that structure, moved away from it and has now come back, you're not gonna get trapped uh, as easily as you would trying to catch the breakout itself. It should come as no surprise that there's a similar balancing act when it comes to immediate versus rounded retest. And it's not the case that one is always better than the other. It's the same old trade-offs, no pun intended. So if you're trading the break, you're more likely to guarantee a trade, but a higher chance of getting trapped with the added detriment of inferior risk to reward, right? So if we go back, for example, to our daily uh, Ethereum example here. One second, let me, oops. Here we are. If, we, if I just bring back ETH. So again, using our immediate versus rounded uh, framework, where do those two trades take place? The immediate trade is within this bit of price action and the rounded trade is within this type of price action. Notice it's the same level, it's just when are you trading it? Are you trading it at the break or on the retest? And now we can assess the framework that we discussed in the previous slide. So if you're trying to do business on this side of the market, the good news is you're almost certainly guaranteed a trade because you can just enter a market, right? The market doesn't need to pull back or do anything really specific in order for you to generate an idea or execute an idea, more importantly. So that's cool. Um, the cost for that is, again, inferior risk reward. Let's say you're wrong below this low or below here is when you really start to question whether your idea is correct. Just from a simple eye test, there's less distance from the level to where you're wrong than from the breakout to where you're wrong. And that difference is crops up in your risk reward. Trading at structure almost always get a, gives you better risk reward than trading away from structure. Okay? So that's, that's the first and kind of foremost consideration. And if we go back, you can see that a higher chance of getting trapped is also something that's worth bearing in mind. In this case, you're, you're, we're working with the daily time frame, so the daily close itself can be a pretty good signal. But if you're actually trying to trade within this candle itself, right, before the daily close or as the market's pushing above the level, you end up potentially falling into that same time frame trap that we discussed earlier. 
there's nothing, there's no worse feeling than being trapped on the wrong side of a breakout trade. If you're trading rounded retests, you can, you can still get trapped if the level fails, but it won't be as harsh a lot of the time, or you have more time to move around it than if you end up being the wick on an, on an attempted breakout. Okay. Now, of course, on the other side of things, if you trade the retests, you're less likely to guarantee a trade, right? Bitcoin dollar uh, on the daily time frame probably being the all-time uh, example of that. I'm going to bring that up right now, actually, because it's quite useful to have. So let's say your idea was to trade the 20k uh, Bitcoin breakout. Let's quickly add that to... No, that's not it. <laughs> let's take the Coinbase chart. Bitcoin, Coinbase, there we are. So 20k breakout level. You get a daily or even weekly close above and your idea is, well, look, I don't want to sacrifice risk reward, so I'll wait for a pullback, then I'll get long into whatever. And as you can see, the market just, just didn't pull back to that. So trading the retest is less likely to guarantee a trade, obviously, if the market doesn't pull back, but lowers the chances of you getting trapped, right? You can still get trapped on rounded retests. It's just, it takes longer and it generally is a bit more obvious and gives you more time to act rather than trading the break event itself. And of course, the extra downside is that same thing we discussed, the chance of no fill, right? The fact that you may leave an order, but the market doesn't come back to it. So we, we've discussed some of the pros and cons. Where does that leave us? Well, the first thing to say is it's not a binary choice, right? Sometimes the break is very clear, but the retest doesn't happen or is very unattractive. Uh, sometimes the breakout is messy, but when the market comes back to the level, it looks really good. Again, I'm not going to be formulaic here because I don't believe those formulas exist. There are pros and cons. It really depends on the context. All the, you know, no two breakouts are the same. The chart may look different. Um, it's one of those decisions you'll have to make based on what's clear to you. Okay. More so, or, or additionally, some of the contextual considerations that we'll cover in a moment will make this decision easier, but there's no, or there are no rules against trading both sides or even no sides. So it's not that one is better than the other, you should always do one and not the other, it's just they're different and be aware of the trade-offs when you're choosing whether to trade a retest. So the first consideration when it comes to retests generally is that Maybe we're dealing with a false dilemma here. A lot of what I've tried to answer is, should you trade the break or the retest? If you're trading the retest, what type, etc., etc. What if it doesn't matter, right? So the basic premise of the false dilemma is you would split your position equally between the break and the retest. And as a result, you don't have to choose one over the other. So for example, the market closes above resistance, you establish 50% of your position on the close, and the other half in the form of a limit order uh, at the level. So whatever example you want to use from our previous uh, charts, I can bring up um, the, I mean, ETH in this case also makes sense. Let me bring that up in a moment. Yeah, here we go. Right, one sec. Nope. Right, same old ETH chart. So let's say you want to trade through this all-time high breakout and if this false dilemma consideration is correct, then you essentially put half on on the candle close above, like forgetting this side of the chart, the retest, etc. Right? Let's just let's just take the all-time high trade uh, that was available. So you would take half on the breakout itself, and then you'd leave half if the market generally, you know, if the market were to pull back to the level, um, and that's it, right? So you've guaranteed a position by trading the breakout, and then you could also trade the retest or get the rest of your size on on the retest if the market pulls back. Now, this may seem like a middle ground which fixes this dilemma or gets rid of it completely, but there are some hidden concerns or concerns which may not be immediately obvious. So the obvious benefit is you get a guaranteed trade even without a pullback, uh, and you also get full sizing if the market offers one. That seems great, right? You, you get the trade on, and if it does pull back, well, great, you have your full exposure that you wanted to in that position. However, there is a significant downside, and it's that the trade is guaranteed to be suboptimal one way or another. Like, something is always going to suck about it, no matter whether the market pulls back or keeps going. And it should be fairly straightforward what those downsides are. If the market does pull back, then your average entry is worse than if you just waited for a retest. And generally speaking, 
a worse average entry becomes less comfortable to manage and more liable to be overtraded, puked early, etc., etc. At the same time, if the market doesn't pull back, then you've only got half size on the trade as opposed to the full exposure that you wanted. And, and there's no way around this, right? So it either pulls back, you get full size at a, sh at, at, at a shittier average, or it doesn't pull back, you've only got half size. You can't go anywhere if you implement the system. You, you, you'll have to suffer the, con you know, the consequences of one or the other. Now, for me personally, I don't trade like this. I just don't. Uh, I, I like to establish positions, what I say, with conviction. And for me, the way my brain works is either the break is so significant that I want exposure as soon as possible, I want my full size and the inferior risk reward is completely justified, or I don't mind missing the move and it's only attractive back at structure uh, and with that boost of having superior risk reward. I personally don't like this neither here nor there approach, uh, but if you're someone who struggles with trade execution uh, and, you know, if it makes sense for you, due to whatever factors, you could consider it. Uh, but for me personally, I don't like the ambiguity, and I don't like that there's a downside built in to the trade itself. But it's certainly one thing to consider. Now, the second thing to consider when it comes to well, do I trade the break or the retest is the idea of precedent, right? And the basic premise is, does the instrument that you're trading, especially in its current trend or with recent price action, offer regular retests? And this is kind of as simple as it sounds, right? If it does offer regular retests, well then great, wait for one. <laughs> and if it doesn't offer a regular retest, then it would be unreasonable for you to expect it. As mentioned, it's mostly as straightforward as it seems, but there are some arguably uncomfortable exceptions or deviations from this rule. So as the trend itself shifts and either becomes more aggressive or slows down, your expectations of a retest should also scale with that. So in a very fast moving trend or market, retests will either not happen at all, or they'll happen very, very quickly, which is something we'll discuss as well in the hidden retest section. At the same time, if the trend slows down and the market starts to consolidate more and it's not as parabolic or aggressive as before, then retests are more common as the market spends more time ranging, right? And that's what I've got in the exception examples there. And my suggestion would just be to look at more recent price action for context and how quickly things are developing or not developing. So I've got a chart example here. Let me jump out. Uh, it's a uni, uni USD on the daily time frame, right? You can see as things, if we, if we just take the breakout levels, so you come here, essentially no retests, no retest, no retest, no retest, no retest, and then when you take the most recent breakout, you get your retests, right? But especially when price moved from the sideways environment and shifted here to start moving parabolically, you could see that none of these bases were kind enough to offer you a retest. So if you were constantly sat with limit bids, uh, you probably weren't feeling too great about it. And just as a kind of general tip, it's always when this first shift occurs, from a large range into the trend forming expansion, right? When it just starts to break out after moving sideways for a long period of time, um, retests just tend to be far less pronounced, uh, if at all existent. And that's really that kind of first trend forming leg. Um, that portion of the market tends to move really, really quickly and not let you in, certainly not on obvious daily time frame pullbacks. Another example, Ave on the daily time frame, um, kind of similar logic here. You have your long-standing consolidation. Um, whether this retests or not, it kind of depends how you draw your levels. Uh, I know for me that most likely would have missed or been like a very partial fill. So maybe not really here. Next breakout, no retest, no retest. Meh slash not really, right? Unless you're taking the immediate trade, which is something we'll talk about. And then finally, once you get your DeFi and market-wide pullback, you get some semblance of a pullback, and even then, I'm not necessarily the most generous thing in the world. And again, it's that same pattern that we just discussed. When you have a long period of sideways, and then you get the trend-forming bullish leg, this kind of impulse that follows tends to be the least forgiving in terms of allowing you to get on board on easy pullbacks.
So, again, by no means the most perfect examples in the world, and I'm sure there are better ones on different time frames, etc. But just to get the basic idea in your mind of, does it make sense, both in terms of context, but also just price history, to wait for a retest? If it does, then don't get greedy. If the market always or generally tends to pull back, then it makes sense to wait for one. Uh, and if it doesn't, well, then maybe you'll have to pay up and swallow the shittier risk to reward um, with the expected benefit of strong moving price action in your favor. So this, again, sounds very straightforward. It is, but a lot of people ignore it. Do I wait for a retest? Well, mate, just look at the chart and see if it makes sense to wait for a retest. That's probably as anecdotal or colloquial as I can make it. This is a big one, right? Probably the most important one, so worth paying attention if you haven't been already. Also, if you've learned anything so far, just go ahead, like the video, uh, that would be awesome feedback for me, and I always read all the comments, and I'm grateful for those of you uh, who engage. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. A few basic premises here. The first is that waiting for a retest or a pullback may be necessary, where entering on the break presents inactionable risk to reward. Okay, so just as a reminder, the closer we trade the structure, that tends to bring better risk reward. And then the further we trade from structure, that usually offers inferior risk to reward. It's that same old trade-off. Now, as a result, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture, sometimes that risk, that, that negative risk to reward or the negative impact on the risk reward simply from the size of the breakdown or breakout or the size of the break can be so big that a follow-up entry doesn't make sense, right? I mean, just purely anecdotally, how many times have you seen, for example, you've got a level here, right? This is your support resistance structure, your target is, let's say, this take profit level at whatever structure that is, and then the market looks like this. Market, oops, let me just align colors, that's your level, and then the market will be in blue. Market comes in, bounces, comes in, offers a weak bounce, and maybe at this point you're thinking, okay, well my trade idea, or my plan, is that if the market breaks down from this level, and then either comes back to retest it or just breaks down from this support generally, I'm going to look to sell this area and target uh, the green level, right? Amazing trading plan. You're essentially selling the loss of support and targeting the next support. Now, instead, I'm sure we've all been there. What the market does is something like this. The next candle just completely rips the market in half. This level gets absolutely hosed and the close looks something like this. Right, this is, imagine this is a red candle here. I'll make it easier for you to visualize. There we go. Now, in these types of scenarios, we were always aware that trading the breakdown incurs a cost or premium in terms of the risk reward. But let's say you want to follow up and trade the breakout. In this case, what would the risk to reward profile be, right? I mean, let's look at it. Your invalidation would say be here, this line, because you don't want price to reclaim the breakdown point. Your entry, best case, right, and this isn't accounting for slippage or anything like that, would be on the candle close, so here. And then your target is still that same old daily support. Now, as a result, the anatomy of that trade is this is your risk, and this is your reward. So you can see that that's not like a, that's not a good trade, right? That, that's not really an actionable risk to reward. Most of the trade is already played out without you getting on board, and that's absolutely fine. More importantly is the point that's made within that previous slide, that sometimes the break is so big that a follow-up entry doesn't make sense. It's already reached the target, or it's so close to the target that it simply, simply doesn't make sense to trade towards it unless that area breaks and then there's another trade entirely, right? Maybe to reframe that if it wasn't clear, I think it was though, it tends to be pretty visually obvious, you can kind of talk to yourself and ask, what move am I trying to capture? It's kind of a twofold question. Part one, what move am I trying to capture? And move two, or question two, how much of that space has already played out as a result of that break. If the break has already taken your idea mostly to target, the risk reward to chase it without a retest often isn't there. 
So in those cases, the market makes it really clear whether you wait for a break or the retest. You obviously have to wait for the retest because the break trade simply isn't available, right? So if we kind of redraw that same example, whereby this is the level, this is our take profit, and then we'll have our market in blue. Again, support comes in, weak bounce, and your plan is to sell this level into the green level. If you end up getting a close like here, right, at that point, the breakout trade that we discussed isn't reasonable or available as a in terms of risk reward. It's just too ugly. So you're kind of forced to wait for a retest. Again, just to make it very explicit, this is the candle close here. What's our risk reward if we're trying to trade the breakdown? Well, this would be our entry. More or less, this would be our invalidation and green is our target. So our risk would be this and our reward would be this. That's not very good, right? Whereas if we taking the same chart apply the idea of selling a retest, well, in that case, invalidation would be unchanged, right? Let's say it's more or less above this high. However, most crucially, the entry would be at or near the structure that's being retested here, and then you've got the same take profit as before, right? So if we were to recalculate the risk reward on the retest trade, you've got your risk here and your reward here, a, a vastly different trade. So what I'm saying is sometimes the breakout or breakdown can decide for you. If it goes too far, the break trade or the immediate trade may not be available and you're forced to trade the retest if you want to trade the idea, simply because of the impact that the break has had on the risk to reward, okay? So that's kind of what I'm getting at with premise one. Now premise two, which kind of leans on that, is that the precision of your entry is inversely correlated with the size of the move you're trying to capture. So if you're trading an intraday range, there's generally less to capture, so your entry must be more precise. And that kind of makes sense, right? You get a lot of intraday ranges, setups, or especially if you're trading much lower time frames. Price moves sideways a lot, so it makes sense for you to be picky or selective with your entry. Like, you don't have a lot of room to work with, so positioning becomes more important. At the same time, if you're trading a high time frame swing, there's more to capture, so your entry can be less precise. Right? The assumption there is obviously the previous example flipped on its head, whereby you get fewer swing trade setups, they occur less frequently, and as a result, you can be, or you can afford to be less selective with your entry. But you don't have to. You don't have to. That's very important. I noticed that a lot of people take this to the extreme and swing traders become really sloppy with their entry. You don't have to be. Uh, it's just about getting the balancing act uh, in, the, in the right direction. Okay? And now basic premise 2.1, which is kind of a re-articulation of the previous one, but this really changed my trading, so I kind of want to emphasize it. The precision of your entry is inversely correlated with the significance of the idea, level, or structure that you're trading. And, and this relies on the premise that not all setups are made equal. And I'm sure we've all been there in cases where, you know, if X breaks, the entire market is going to shit 20%. Or the opposite of that, if Y breaks, the, whole, the, market is, the market is just going to mega moon, there's no, no resistance in sight. In those cases, does it really matter whether your entry is 1% or 3% away from X? So a good example is the Bitcoin all-time high, right? The 20k breakout, the 2017 one. If your idea is that the Bitcoin all-time high breakout is just going to absolutely send this market with no resistance in sight, does it ultimately matter whether your entry is at 20,800, 20,000... 200, 21,100, I mean, ultimately it doesn't, right? Those, those deviations or marginal differences are just that, marginal differences. If you're swinging for 30, 40K, it doesn't really matter whether your entry is 20.1 or 20.2, right? But of course, if you're trading a tight intraday range where the rotations are 2, 3%, you do have to be more, more precise with your entry and those few percentage points start to matter, right? So it's to do with context, and that, that should be pretty, pretty self-explanatory. So for example, if you're trading 
within here, right? This is your range. Then you need to be a bit more selective in terms of where you enter, right? If you're trying to buy, you're looking to do business at support and you're looking to sell at resistance. It doesn't really make sense for you to chase a breakdown or breakout up here simply because of the proximity of resistance. You've got less to work with, so you need more precision. At the same time, if your, you know, your resistance is up here and your support is down here, does it really matter whether you enter kind of here, here, maybe even up to here, etc. if you've got all this space available? Now, yes, it still matters, right? If we still want to optimize our trades, but it matters far less where you've got boundaries with space between them. Like, this is a very obvious example, right? If you're targeting 10%, like, if you're targeting 20, 30, 50%, 1, 2% doesn't matter. If you're targeting a 3 to 5% move, suddenly 1% matters a lot. I don't want to sit on this point for too long because it's fairly self-explanatory, but it's something that people, including myself, get wrong a lot. And this is where the last point comes in, where opportunity costs from missing a rare setup just because the entry wasn't perfect can suck. And the big Bitcoin inflection points come to mind, right? The reclaim of 6K after the bear market breakdown, the 20K breakout towards all-time high. If you got the balance of those situations wrong and you were kind of too precise trying to catch the perfect wick instead of just trading the idea, you probably missed out on some of the easier moves available in the market, right? So your precision is inversely correlated with the size of the move you're trying to capture. If you're scalping or kind of day trading, you're going for less, so you should demand more from your entry. If you're going for big, big plays at key turning points, you're targeting more, so your entry is slightly less significant. Okay, you've got room to work with at the very least. That should make sense. If it doesn't, please let me know in the comments. I'll try to, uh, try to clarify. Now, an extra consideration when it comes to trading retests or breakouts is the idea of hidden retests. So the basic premise here is that in fast moving, well, in fast moving markets, the high time frame breaks that occur sometimes do offer retests, but they occur on lower time frames. As a result, those lower time frame retests aren't always visible on higher time frames. So the example which comes to mind, and I'll bring up a chart uh, momentarily to reflect this, is that you can have a market, this is a very good example, yeah, you can have a market um, where the daily time frame or weekly time frame just looks like it's gone up forever and offered no pullbacks at all, but if you look on a slightly lower time frame, you do get a pullback, it's just very short-lived. And the reason I call it hidden retests is because that low time frame retest isn't always visible on the high time frame chart from which the idea is derived. So let's bring an example with BNB, actually. So we've got the BNB weekly chart here. You've got a big floor on the weekly, right? And it looks like, just looking at the weekly candle closes, the market closed above and just mega mooned, right? If you look a bit more carefully, you can actually see that you did have a wick back into this level. Okay, so some evidence that maybe there was some sort of opportunity to get involved, just not on the weekly, but instead on a lower time frame. And indeed, if we then look at that same level on the daily time frame, it actually offered a very orderly and clear retest of that weekly structure before offering that seemingly parabolic move higher. So this is kind of, in a weird way, the opposite of the wick trap type of setup we discussed at the beginning of the video, where you end up buying high time frame resistance and selling high time frame uh, support. This is the positive version of that, where instead of being the wick that gets trapped, you're the wick of the high time frame candle before it moves a lot in your favor. Okay, so it's kind of, again, the reason it, it's quote unquote hidden is because this looks like a straight line up. But if you zoom in or move, you know, move down a couple time frames, you can see that the market did offer something. It just wasn't necessarily obvious or easy uh, to get on board. I think I've got another example of this, if memory serves correctly. Let me check. If I don't find it immediately, I'll just... Um... Yeah, actually, this is a good example. Here we go. Bitcoin Weekly. Um also offered a kind of hidden retest. And this is one we discussed on the stream. Again, this is an example of 
a weekly breakout which is actionable or your entry was possible on the daily time frame and this scales down right you could have a daily setup which looks like it went straight up with the quote unquote hidden retest taking uh, place on the four hour uh, it kind of scales with time frames so here another example we had a weekly range highest close range high it looks like you get a close above and then the market just moves right and certainly there's no kind of weekly red candle coming back to retest this level uh, before moving higher but you can see there was a wick Right? And again, this wick formed after price closed above the level. And then in the same vein, we know there's a weekly breakout. And if we jump down one time frame to the daily, similar to the BNB chart, there was a reasonably orderly break and retest on the daily time frame before that big candle kicked in as well. Right, This bit of price action here. Hopefully those examples are helpful. I'm sure there are others, but just to revisit... So capitalizing on this should be reasonably apparent. Uh, you can consider leaving limit orders at the broken structure and or monitoring it on lower time frames. So again, you get a big weekly break. You're thinking maybe there's a wick I can catch in the next few days before the next weekly leg. You get a big daily break. You're thinking maybe there's a short term or very fast intraday wick I can, touch, I can catch before the daily leg kicks in. The third point is very important, kind of the nature of these retests, is that they're often short-lived and happen very quickly. Now that may seem like a negative point, that you don't get a lot of time to act, but that's actually exactly what you want to see when there's real imbalance in the market with one side rolling over. There is nothing worse than having a high time frame level that you deem as important, the market breaking it and then just getting stuck, right? If anything, that's a bad sign. Generally speaking, the more time the price spends stuck or just consolidating at or near an important level after breaking it, the more likely the break is to fail. If we, if we kind of think to first principles, what kind, of, what kind of behavior do we expect from market participants at those levels is that you have a big area where a lot of people are looking to trade, you have big participation, and then one side gets rinsed, right? We want to see evidence of imbalance, impulsiveness, whatever. And when one side gets rinsed, the market should generally move quickly, right? Like if buyers end up coming out on the right side and the level breaks, right, resistance breaks, then sellers are even either getting liquidated, they're forcibly closing, puking their positions, whatever, and, and the imbalance just becomes very skewed. So let's take the Bitcoin uh, example just to kind of uh, talk through it very briefly. Where are you? Yeah, you know what? Nope. So the basic idea here, I'm not going to spend too long on it, but you have resistance. When resistance is broken, you want the market to move higher. Why? Because sellers at the level are either liquidated or they are closing their positions. Sells closing at market become orders to buy, and that just fuels the upside, right? As well as liquidations having a similar effect as well as smarter participants who then follow up on the breakout and exert pressure on those sellers looking to close. And the same works in the opposite direction, right? You've got, let's say, a big level of support. The market breaks it, and you generally expect a move lower. Why? Well, buyers at that level are wrong, and as they close out and or get liquidated, those orders those buy orders, which close, become orders to sell, which just fuels on the way down. You get more participation, selling the breakdown, liquidations, etc., etc. This is something we cover in the order flow video. The market microstructure points themselves aren't like super important. Um, but the basic idea is you want big level, big participation, and then one side gets rinsed. When one side gets rinsed, that's where you get your big moves, big imbalance. And the less time that those who are wrong get to close, the more likely you've got a big expansion on your hands. Now the fifth consideration, context, probably the most valuable, or I mean, I've already said that about one of the other sections, uh, but this is important, right? Now some points to revisit. So the basic framework we followed thus far, losing support is bearish, the breakdown and or retest may be a chance to sell, breaking resistance is typically bullish, the breakout or the retest may be a chance to buy, okay? That's sort of the model we've been working with. 
Now, it's important to note, as discretionary traders, that this isn't always applicable. In fact, there are times at which we want to ignore this or even do the opposite. And these are just a few of them. The first is that in a range-bound environment, chasing the breakdown or chasing the breakout could be quite ugly or end unfavorably. So in a range, resistance is for selling and support is for buying. That much is straightforward. However, price will often poke at or through the extremes, so through resistance or below support, before reverting to the mean. So in a range-bound environment, a, the probability of a failed breakdown at support or a failed breakout at resistance is much higher. So let's say you have a range. It's your support. This is your resistance. Your general approach, if you've correctly identified the market when it's consolidating, is that you're looking to be a seller at or around the upper boundary, that extreme, and you're looking to be a buyer at or around the lower boundary and the other extreme. As a result, one way to get trapped is to constantly chase any price action that occurs through those boundaries, but in the opposite direction, right? So if you're always trying to buy the range high in one form or another, there's a good chance that you end up being the wick before the market mean reverts, right? And again, these levels aren't always perfect. You will often get the market attempt to break out and then not find acceptance and ultimately get pushed down, right? And this ends up being your wick, deviation, whatever it may be. And this is the person you don't want to be, right? And the same happens uh, on the support side of things at the range low. You will often get attempts, not just perfectly bouncing from the level, right? Markets are messy. You will get attempts to drive price lower and actually break from balance uh, and break from the range, but instead they fail, the market doesn't find acceptance below the range low, and it actually gets bought up, and then those guys are trapped, right? So in a, in a real or compelling, I suppose, range-bound environment, it's very risky to be a seller on any move below or a buyer on any move above. This can get real trappy very quickly, and especially if the market doesn't offer acceptance and a break from balance in a very significant manner, that's how you get trapped, okay? So the, the one sentence summary of that is don't break out or break down chase in a range. Um, it's, it's, it's not a good way to trade. A similar rule applies to when you're trading either in a strong underlying trend or at high time frame structure. So in a bull trend or at support, failed breakdown setups are likely. And in a bear trend or at resistance, failed breakout setups are likely. And we do have some charts for that. Let me bring them up. I really need an assistant or something to, you know, do all this, do all this magic. I'm clearly not hugely competent. Here we go. Are they? So you'll recall that strong underlying trend in a bull trend, failed breakdown setups are likely. So let's take Ave as an example. Uh, number go up. This is Ave against Bitcoin. Very strong trend right? Number increasing, very good. And we have this range low here uh, at 26s, right? This pre lowest close before this move up. Uh, and this is a really good example of what I was talking about. Let me make the line slightly less thick so we can actually see some of the price action. Here's our range low. And again, we know the trend is up. And in those cases, we generally expect support to hold. So in this case, you get a close below the level, and so you may be thinking immediately if you're just blanket applying the framework that, okay, well, breaks of support are bearish. We look to sell rallies or use that as an opportunity to get a short position in order to, whatever, maybe buy back lower or just to get short the market. And you can see in this case, it ended up being a trap, and the market actually sprung, used that level, and then went higher. Okay? Now, again, context is what's important. You know that the underlying trend is strong, and you know that you've got a partial close below the level, uh, and then, again, without the benefit of hindsight, does it even make sense to look for shorts in this type of environment? Maybe not, right? Because when the market breaks from this level, given the preceding trend, and given it's an area of support, generally speaking, or on the balance of probabilities, who's more likely to get trapped at support in a strong trend? And my contention is that at support, in a strong trend, bears are more likely to get trapped than bulls, right? Or sellers are more likely to put put their foot wrong at support 
um, than buyers, obviously. Uh, so it's a basic case of kind of not always trusting stuff like this, or at the very least not chasing it uh, without having good reason to do so. Okay, so this is just one example of a strong trend, price at support, a breakdown setup, which fails, and then you can see the same level as used before the leg up. So it's kind of worth being cautious of those breakdowns and kind of generally not worth chasing them if you have higher time frame reasons to believe that the trend is up. And the same kind of applies to Litecoin just in the inverse, right? Like Litecoin against Bitcoin, this is a multi-year kind of downtrend, okay? And then you have this previous support turn resistance type thing. And you can see that the market actually broke above the level on this occasion, which sort of looks like a breakout. Now, again, the same rules apply. You know you've got a multi-year downtrend here, uh, and you get your first break above resistance. So again, on the balance of probabilities, is this likely to be the market structure reversal which sends it to the moon, or is it likely to be some sort of trappy setup which doesn't amount to much? Again, there's no perfect heuristic or framework for this, but at the very least, knowing the context, again, with the whole point of this slide is the context, the whole context is this has been going down for years, so should you have a lot of faith in the breakout, probably not slash worth being conservative. In the same vein here, this has been going up for months. Should you have a lot of faith in the breakdown? Probably not, or worth being conservative as well. And I think the last point makes this point, the last bullet point conveys this message quite well. Even if there's follow through, the better setup is still hunting a buy at reclaimed support or kind of selling back below resistance. So those options are much more attractive than chasing the counter trend move, right? So in the Aave example, like even if it is a, you know, even if the market does break support there, because the high time frame context is bullish, you shouldn't look to chase the bearish trade and say, okay, well, this may be bearish. In that case, I'll either buy the reclaim or buy lower, right? Or with the Litecoin example, this may be bullish, uh, but I'll either sell... I'll sell the attempted, I'll sell back below the, the breakout level, right? Or I'll buy higher. In a strong market, there's no need to chase the first leg. That's that's the basic point we're trying to get across um, in that example. I haven't made it terribly clear, but just be aware of which side is likely getting trapped here. And even if the breakout or breakdown is genuine, does it make sense to chase it? And a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the time, the answer is is kind of simply no. Right. I'm going to bring up the Aave example just one more time to try to make that super clear. Let me click it. Here we are. Right. So this is this is the level that we were dealing with here. So let's say you get this candle close. And what I'm trying to encourage you all to think of in terms of your framework is in the short term, right, without the benefits of hindsight, let's even remove that here. Does this candle close look bearish? Yes. Does that mean that you have to chase it or sell it at all? No. Why? because the preceding trend and the market context is bullish. So what do I do instead? You either buy back at support lower or you buy back the reclaim higher. But the bearish trade isn't something you have to execute if the high time frame context is bullish. That should make sense. I think I've made that way more clear in there. So if high time frame context bull no rush or need to execute bear trades. Can wait for bull trades higher or lower, right? If the high time frame context is bullish, like we have here, there's no rush or need to execute the bearish trades, even if they happen, because the higher probability trades generally are still on the bullish side, and they will occur either lower at support or higher if the breakdown gets reclaimed. In the same vein, if 
high time frame context bare, there's no rush or even need to execute bull trades. You can wait for bear trades lower or higher. Right? I think that's way clearer than in the slides, and hopefully this example um, has made that point reasonably obvious. But what, what you see, that, like a very common mistake that I've observed, is that the market looks really, really strong, and then on the first break of any support, any pullback, any red candles, uh, it's all, you know, jump ship and uh, abandon ship, whatever. And that doesn't necessarily make sense, because nothing has changed in the high time frame, under, you know, overarching context until proven otherwise. So, here. Maybe this is one that's worth screenshotting and what I'm getting at, generally. Nice rescue. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's that. And then the final bit, rounded retest context, is that a lot can happen between a break and the subsequent retest of the level, right? Price action moves, the market moves, news moves, etc. So, and that applies in terms of time as, and structure. So a classic example is a break of hourly support, which reaches daily support and then comes back to the hourly support turn resistance. Like, do you want to sell that? And a lot of the time the answer is no. Why? Because the breakout target was reached and you're essentially fading a daily bounce with a lower time frame structure. So the probability of the trade is lower altogether. Don't worry, I know that's a lot of talking. That is, there is a chart example uh, coming up to that effect. And it's actually Bitcoin, uh, that same 44,850 level. So let's go here. There we are. And it's this same daily range low here, right? 44,850. And then we look at it through our low time frame lens. Another example, it's kind of going back to the candle trap, whatever example. Um, but this also makes sense here. So you have an area of lower time frame support resistance in the form of this black level, okay? The market looks, it looks like a bearish retest, right? The market breaks down, retests it, trades lower, and then comes back for a rounded retest of that area. Now, at this point, you know that you're in an area of daily support, and the market's kind of springing back from a potential wick area straight into that level. Does it make sense to sell the rounded retest of this structure? It's far less attractive, right? On the break, it kind of makes sense because you could potentially be seeing a flip of that daily level into resistance just on lower time frames. But when it comes back, the, the context is just, at least for me, significantly less attractive than it was uh, previously, right? There's a similar example with ETH. Actually, if we use its all-time high level, I'm going to bring that up here. So if we use that prior 2017 high at whatever, 1400, and look at it uh, from an hourly lens, this actually, this example is actually way better than the Bitcoin one. So again, we know that 13, like 1400 is daily support. And let's look at the rounded retest context here. So there's an intraday level, a massive area here, right? The the 1420s uh, or thereabouts. You have support, 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 breakdown. And then at this point, when it comes back, that's the rounded retest of that same area, right? So purely on an intraday basis, this looks like an amazing sell here. When it comes back to sort of rounded retest the level after the break. But again, the context, what happened between the break and the rounded retest. Well, what happened was price reached a weekly and daily level, right? So suddenly the trade isn't the same. It's not just the fact that you've got prior lows and you're selling it into prior highs. You're essentially selling the bounce coming from a high time frame level into a low time frame level. Do you see that contextual shift? Suddenly, this black box isn't a level in the middle of nowhere. Instead, you're fading a, an hourly, using an hourly resistance, you're fading a daily or weekly bounce from the best level available on the chart. 
So the trade, the breakdown trade here is not the same as the rounded retest trade here because, and the main difference was the retest of a high time frame support structure in the interim, right? So again, not all levels are equal and context vary as well. Where is price coming from? Do I want to stand in front of it? Having that picture in your mind of what has happened between the break and the retest can be really important. Even from, from just a diagram point of view, I can come up with the following. Let's say you have got resistance here from the hourly time frame. You've got a much, I'll even make it kind of scarier. You've got resistance here oops, from the daily time frame. And then we'll plot the market in blue to kind of get this context point home. So you've got hourly, resistance, resistance, the market breaks, you know, starts moving, you get your typical rounded retest type of stuff going on, right? The market moves, it then hits this daily level of resistance and then starts moving back towards our hourly level. And assume there's some, you know, the distance between these two isn't that great. Now, again, this is context is really important here. If this daily level didn't exist, then the rounded retest trade of resistance, resistance, boom, comes back to support. This looks good, right? It looks very textbook, very straightforward. But the context suddenly makes this a much riskier trade because at that point, you're not just buying a retest of an hourly level, you're standing in front of a daily move with an hourly level. And what you see a lot in swing trading is the following setup. So you've got like a daily level here, an intermediate or lower time frame intraday level here, and then another daily level as support. So the actual high time frame move happens from A to B. The big daily level does its job and price generally moves towards the other daily level as support. What you don't want to do is ignore this larger high time frame context, which is going to move the market more and end up being the knife catcher between these two uh, powerful forces, if you will. I don't expect this to be immediately clear, but it's just at least in the back of your mind worth keeping some sort of understanding or awareness of what's the larger context in the market. If you just tunnel vision on this and see it as an hourly retest of previous resistance turned support, that can work, but you'll sometimes just get steamrolled and only later realize that there's some higher time frame stuff in play. So that's really what I mean by context. What happened between the break and the retest? And if what happened is price reached a really strong level of resistance and is now moving down, that affects the probability of the of the lower time frame trade you want to trade, especially if you're punting against higher time frame forces. Okay, so that's what I mean by context. That's sort of all I've got. There's no single answer or formula. Breakouts vary, retests vary. As we've seen, contexts vary, which I haven't explained amazingly well, but hopefully clearly enough. As with all my content, you know, my goal is to arm you with tools to make well-reasoned decisions within a replicable intelligent framework, etc., etc. Kind of think for yourself, poke around concepts, ideas, which make sense to me and find your own edge. With regard to the trade entry precision, I'll restate the following, is that don't be complacent where a good entry matters, but don't be greedy where a pristine entry isn't required. I definitely could have used that lesson uh, a couple of years ago. I know the bit about context towards the end got a bit grindy and maybe wasn't entirely clear, but as a discretionary trader, context is not only your friend, it's likely your edge. You know, we should always look to build an understanding of all the moving parts or more moving parts of the market and not just look at levels in complete isolation that break out, buy, you know, break down, sell. That, you know, if that's how you trade, you could just automate your own strategy, backtest it and not have anything to do with it. It's very likely that you can forge some sort of edge if you make those contextual assessments as to whether you want to trade the breakout, whether you want to trade the breakdown, you know, what happened between the break and the retest, all those things, all those balancing acts and context that we discussed throughout this presentation, at least for me, that's where I got my edge. 
and I'm sure that's a good source for yours as well if you trade anything like I do. The last point is somewhat cynical, generic wisdom about no replacement for screen time, duo and research, etc. But it is serious. You know, the whole 15 minutes a day, 4x on the beach, leave a couple of limit orders, go chill type of bullshit. Uh, it's, it's not how you learn to trade. There's no better teacher than screen time. And for the, all of you who kindly reach out over DMs and ask, you know, I've watched all your videos, I've read all your articles, where do I go next? My answer is the market. You go to the market. <laughs> it's the best teacher. Finally, quick plugs, please like the video if you haven't already and leave a comment. I will read every single comment as I always do, and the likes are great feedback for me to let me know whether I should keep this technical analysis series going. Uh, for those of you who want more content, I stream every single week on the Technical Roundup YouTube channel, link available in the description below. If you want to go ask questions and hang out generally, uh, we tend to have a pretty um, nice atmosphere and you know, it's fun. So come watch me live if that's your cup of tea. And as for the podcast, under the same name, Technical Roundup, we talk to pretty interesting people and try to pry alpha uh, from them. There's also a newsletter for those of you who just want the analysis and the levels and don't really care about learning. trletter.com is the uh, link to that. We send one email a week. There's no upselling. It's free. Just scroll, click, look at the charts, read our analysis. And yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you for watching and bearing with me for three, four years, however long it's been. I hope this was helpful. If it was, let me know. If it wasn't, let me know. I'll try to answer your question and make it helpful. That's all I've got for now. Take care, and I'll see you next time.